I have said often that when these type of presentations occur, uh, the auditorium should be filled with children. Yes. They should hear these stories. They should be told the sacrifices and the price that many of our Americans have paid. The other group of people I have often said should be involved are immigrants. People coming to our country should come and hear these stories firsthand and they should meet people like our, our veterans that are in the off audience today and, and hear their stories and understand the sacrifices that were made to <coughs> position America where we are today, where we're one of the only countries in the world that would have to put up a border to keep people out, not to keep their people in. And so um, I've been invited to talk about the Purple Heart. Now, I've made this, this talk probably at least 100 times uh, to Rotaries, Kiwanis, Lions Clubs, schools, churches, uh, veterans organizations. And I never get tired of telling the story, but this time I did some extra research because I thought maybe there's more to the story than what I've told over the years, so I did some extra research. But I want to compliment the music. You've done a wonderful job. What a wonderful national anthem was sung for us this morning. What a wonderful prayer was prayed. This is a blessed day. Before I start, I, I, I brought a Purple Heart medal. It, it happens to be my Purple Heart medal. Um, and my, my question to you, to you is this. this. This medal can be purchased at most <coughs> PXs or BXs around the country. You can buy it online. So I guess my question to you would be, what's the value of this piece of metal hanging from a piece of ribbon? You can buy them for about twenty dollars. So is that the is that the value of this metal? Would that would that be the value of this metal? Twenty dollars. <clears throat> Mine, you might some of you up close can see, happens to have a couple of attachments on it, and they're called oak leaf clusters, which means that I was wounded on three separate occasions. The first time I got wounded, I had two pieces of grenade shrapnel on my right leg, and. Um, the second time I was wounded in the spine, was paralyzed for several minutes. And the last time I got shot twice, once by a machine gun and once by an AK-47. So I'm kind of lucky to be here talking to you today. <laughs> I, take, I did not take any day for granted. I was 19 the first time I was wounded and 20 the second two times. So as I look at this, if, if you can buy this medal for 20 bucks off the rack, uh, and it's got two oak leaf clusters for three, but I guess it'd be worth 60 bucks. Well, keep that in mind, I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit. The history of the Purple Heart, it goes way back to the origins of our country. When General George Washington led his revolutionary troops during the Revolutionary War, the colonial Ar Ar army, um, they had essentially won the war by 1782. It was over, the British was acquiesced, they're giving up. And so they were meeting in Paris to negotiate the, the peace. And so the army was still intact and still in camp. And um, the sad thing about this, if you may not read your history books, is that George Washington's troops were ready to revolt. They were ready to revolt. They had been uh, poorly treated. And you're saying, why would people who had just fought a war have won be will, ready to mutiny or revolt. Well, uh, the enlisted men and the officers both uh, got together and the morale was so low that they did not feel that it could be retrieved. And there's a book called Almost a Miracle by John Furling. And in it, John Furling said, never in military history has an army been so cruelly abused by its military or political masters, by the political masters. Now just imagine that. This ragtag army had fought through winters, had fought through against superior force against the English, and won. And yet, in spite of that, the Continental Congress refused to do some basic things. What did they refuse to do? They refused to buy medicine to take care of the wounded. They refused to feed the troops. And there are stories, if any of you are historians, there are stories told about Washington's group in encampment 
taking off their boots and boiling them and eating the leather. One situation they told about George Washington going through and talking to his troops and he came upon a person eating a skillet full of what he thought was rice. And he said, well, rice is good, soldier. And the soldier said, sir, these are, are fried maggots. He was eating maggots for the protein. That's how poorly our troops were treated uh, in 1782. Washington realized this, decided I've got to do something, I have to take immediate action or we're gonna lose our troops before this peace accord is even signed. And so he decided he was gonna have two new honors. One is called the Badge of Distinction and one's called the Badge of Merit. Now little is known of what happened to the Badge of Distinction. But there's another story for the Badge of Merit. The Badge of Merit was a cloth-shaped heart on purple cloth with gold lettering and it said one word on it, merit. That's all it said, M-E-R-I-T. The word was to be sewn on the uniform over the heart and there had two purposes. One, the heart showed courage and the word merit showed loyalty and patriotism. Now, most people don't know that the badge of merit was a forerunner of two medals. Two. One, the Medal of Honor, and two, the Purple Heart. Um, some people don't know that you can earn a Medal of Honor for heroism without ever being wounded. Not get a scratch, but simply by your own. So the Medal of Honor uh, is, is a, our top award for heroism, but you don't have to be wounded. However, for a Purple Heart, you must be wounded in action in a combat scenario. So on April 17th, 1783, Washington had had this in force for a year, and none of his commanders ever put up anyone for the Badge of Merit. None. And he issued a demand, you must find the people who were her heroes in our wars, and we must recognize them because things were about to disband. They were about to disband the army. So the, bad, the, the Merit Board submitted the names of three people, Sergeant Elijah Churchill, Sergeant William Brown and Sergeant Daniel Bissell. Now, interestingly enough, apparently not one of those people were ever wounded in action, but they were extremely heroic. And so the badge of merit was awarded to them. Now, there weren't many of those awarded, and the reason for that is that some reports say there were only six ever awarded in history. And the reason for that is in June of that year, remember that was April, in June, just a few months later, the army was disbanded because a peace accord happened and the men were anxious to go home. And so they went home. And so the badge of merit was awarded to only a few people. For 150 years, 150 years, all wars, everything, no honor, no nothing except occasional what they call wound strike was awarded for being wounded. And then on February 22nd, 1932, on the 200th anniversary of George Washington's birthday, General Douglas MacArthur and President Herbert Hoover, who I think is an Iowa boy, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> decided that they needed a medal to honor those who were wounded in combat. And so they established a medal called the Purple Heart. Now here's another interesting thing. There's a great dispute over why, why it's called a Purple Heart. The prevailing reason is that there is a wood called Purple Heart Wood that is extraordinarily hard and apparently was used as combatants in certain wars to, as clubs. And it was so hard and so indestructible that they called the metal the Purple Heart. Now there's other, there's other stories too, but apparently that's the prevailing one. Now the other irony about the Purple Heart is there are very few records kept anywhere about who's got a Purple Heart. It's on your records if you're discharged, but there's no big list. You can't call the governor's office or the National Guard and say, I'd like to get a list of all the Bell or all the Purple Heart recipients here in Iowa. It doesn't exist. They can tell you who's got a license plate and all that, but there is no grand, there is no grand list. Isn't that interesting? So the records indicate, and the records are, are a kind of a guess, the records indicate 250,000 World War I veterans retroactively applied for a Purple Heart because there was no Purple Heart in World War I, but back in 
1932. They were allowed to retroactively pass for it. And interestingly enough, General Douglas MacArthur got two of them. And when I was at his museum in Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia, I asked a curator of the MacArthur Museum, I didn't know he was wounded. How did he get wounded? And he got a wry smile on his face, so I knew there was going to be a story coming. Well, he, 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 kind, of, he kind of shook his head. He said, well, uh, General MacArthur, who was a general of World War I, uh, smelled gas twice. <laughs> smelled gas on two occasions. It wasn't gas like some of our people. I know uh, Jerry Meek's dad was gas, actually gas and, and disabled. Being out, he smelled gas twice and got himself two purple hearts. So anyhow, so apparently 250,000 World War I veterans got them. After that, war rec records show that 300,000 killed in action got the Purple Heart in World War II. An additional 650,000 got medals for being combat wounded. That's World War II. Then in Korea, there were 33,600 killed in action and 103,000 wounded in action. They all got Purple Hearts. Vietnam, there was 47,000 uh, Purple Hearts uh, given out. I, on the wall in Washington, D.C., there's over 58,000 names. And if you heard, I said 47,000. Because if you had a heart attack and died in Vietnam, your name's on the wall. But you don't get a Purple Heart for that. So that's why the 10,000 disparity, okay? Uh, 153,000 were wounded in action in Vietnam. Since Vietnam, all other wars, apparently about 50,000 medals of honor have been given out. And today, Best estimate is there's 450,000 living Purple Heart recipients in America. So now I close with the same question I posed to you earlier. At the outset of my speech, I said, what's the true value of this little piece of cloth and metal? Well, what might a 19-year-old young man who lost both of his legs in combat say this is worth? What about a young lady who lost her sight for the rest of her life say this mold is worth. What about someone who's burned over 90% of their body, third degree burn, say that metal of this worth? Because they all received it. Remember, you can buy this off the shelf or internet, right? Well, the true metal, you know, value of this metal is priceless. It's priceless. There's no amount of money you can buy one of these for and understand the value. And the reason it's priceless, because as long as our young men and young women are willing to serve our country and defend its values and constitution, <clears throat> that medal will be priceless forever. But the day that our people in America no longer stand up and are willing to sacrifice life and limb in the defense of our national values. And ladies and gentlemen, this metal at that moment is worthless. So today, I say to you, it's priceless. And I thank you all for coming out today. Oh, I wanted to say one more thing. The interesting thing on the back of the Purple Heart Medal, it doesn't say for combat wounds. Who knows what it says on the back? Merit. Just like the original battle. Thank you very much, everybody. Our next speaker is Dr. Douglas Biggs, who is a professor at the University of Nebraska, Kearney. I hope I pronounced that right. Kearney, not Kearney, Kearney. Now, he got a good start in Ames, Iowa, because his dad was a professor at Iowa State University. He uh, got a bachelor's and master's degree from Iowa State and then a PhD from the University of Minnesota. <laughs> His field of study is medieval history, and that's a far piece from, from this. But he has gained an appreciation, and through his experiences and his work as a university professor, where he interacts with veterans from all fracases. And I think he'll have some very interesting things to talk about, about what some of our veterans today are experiencing. So, Tony. <laughs> Sadler, is it? Yeah. 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 
Bell of the Green Beret. Uh, thank you, Larry. And thank you all for inviting me back again this year. It is a great honor and privilege to speak before a group of veterans, especially as we celebrate, as we do this year, the 50th anniversary of American involvement in Vietnam. For my comments this morning, my friend Bill Campbell, who couldn't be here because he's with family in North Carolina, set before me a pretty daunting task to find, as he put it, uh, and I quote, a silver lining in regards to American involvement in Vietnam. Something, and I quote, uplifting, unquote, he said, because many things that came out of that experience, the Vietnam experience, positive. I must confess that the first thing that entered my mind when I read his email was to recall the controversy, some of it pretty bitter, around the 1995 Walt Disney movie, Operation Dumbo Drop. For those of you who have not seen this film, I highly recommend it to you. The story centers on an episode in 1968 where the Viet Cong murder a lone element, an elephant in a Montagnard village as punishment for the Montagnard citizens helping American soldiers. Without the elephant to provide much of the manual labor needed for the village, it was in trouble and many people they feared would die. Yet, the Americans, special forces folks, come to the rescue, and after many adventures, they find a new elephant and airdrop the pachyderm into the village, and all ends well. Well, there is no doubt that the Disney film uh, does a lot of sanitizing of the horrors of war, and is loosely based on historical events and the efforts of the special forces team to provide reliable transportation for a Montagnard village to get its lumber to a sawmill, it is nevertheless an interesting story. And I use this as my opening example because many of the critics, when they looked at the film in 1995, had more than a visceral reaction to it. As one, who wrote at the time for the San Francisco Chronicle, thundered. The movie was nothing more, and I quote his words, than ludicrous fantasy. Because everyone knows no American did anything good in Vietnam. Of course, the very certainty of that critic's statement in the face of the truth of the Special Forces mission clearly demonstrates that his view of American involvement in Vietnam is ludicrous fantasy rather than the other way around. As a professional historian, it is very difficult to speak of Vietnam without admitting that the war is one of the least understood conflicts in American history. And that any discussion of Vietnam, even now half a century later, often provokes strong emotions. One need only recall the intensity, which I'm sure we all can, of the swift boat ads from then Senator John Kerry's 2004 presidential run to remind us that the hatreds between Senator John Kerry, then Senator John Kerry, now Secretary of State, and John O'Neill still burned brightly more than 30 years after they faced off in their famous debate on the Dick Cavett Show over American involvement in Vietnam in June of 1971. Indeed, as we all historians, all of us historians do, one can pick one's interpretation of the war and support it with a myriad of solid evidence to back up your point of view. Maybe we entered a war that we just could not win. Or maybe we were led by complete incompetence in Washington or in Saigon. Or maybe we weren't allowed to win the war. Or even, which is very current in historiography, perhaps we did win the war. And then the Republic of Vietnam collapsed in 1975. Most people's understanding of the war was, and perhaps still is, shaped by the media and textbooks 
which filter perceptions of the conflict through the lens of politics, morals, and money. Much like Walt Disney filtered the Special Forces operation through the lens of family entertainment in 1995. Since the revolution itself in the 1770s and 1780s, American success or failure in all of its military conflicts has been gauged by the standard of perceptions current in any given decade. For me, when I look at this issue of the Vietnam War and American involvement in it, when I look for silver linings that Bill asked me to find, it's not so much found in the years of the conflict itself, though I'm sure there are some that are there, as to be found in the years that come after. One, of the as one aspect of that silver lining centers, I think, on what used to be called shell shock in the Great War or combat fatigue in World War II, which many American servicemen and women suffered from upon returning from Vietnam. The Veterans Administration and other mental health organizations worked throughout the 1970s to identify and diagnose symptoms devise and alter treatment plans to fit individuals suffering with what we call post-traumatic stress disorder, and try to cure, I put that in quotes, their patients, or at the very least, alleviate their suffering. The ongoing work done with many Vietnam veterans since the 1970s has developed into a wide range of benefits for current veterans returning from the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other parts of the globe. For me, as a college professor who has dealt and still deals with a good number of student veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan, I can certainly and honestly say, without the experiences gained from the 1970s, the counseling staff at my university, which I think is pretty darn good, would not be equipped to successfully help our current service personnel transition back into civilian life. To me, the identification of PTSD Understanding it and treating it is one of the parts of the silver lining to the cloud. A second part of that silver lining for me is the nation's understanding of its veterans and its soldiers and how properly to honor them. My dad, who flew 67 combat missions over occupied France, Belgium, and Holland in 1943 and 1944 as a bombardier on a B-26, came back with a chest full of medals and enough stories to last a lifetime. He and his fellow World War II veterans were honored for the rest of their lives. And of course, Tom Brokaw labeled them as a whole the greatest generation, his 1998 book of that name. As we all know, this was not the reception that our Vietnam veterans received returning home. The disgraceful treatment of returning vets in the 1970s was replaced by what some have argued is a patronizing, or was a patronizing attitude in the 1980s and 90s. But hopefully in our time, any patronizing attitude has been replaced by a new way or new method of treating our servicemen and women and our veterans. Today, as I see it, the vast majority of Americans respond positively when dealing with our current servicemen and servicewomen especially when they are in uniform. Many times over the last decade, on layovers in airports around the country, I witnessed the respect shown to military personnel in uniform. Whether we were waiting in line for a quick McDonald's dinner or sitting in an airport bar, more often than not, a serviceman or servicewoman's money was simply no good because someone like me picked up the tab. I think that we as a nation and this is a work in progress, I realize, are working to overcome our shame over our initial treatment of Vietnam veterans. And those who have come after are the beneficiaries of what I hope is a more mature and more thoughtful country. The last glimmer of a silver lining that I want to suggest this morning is the willingness of our Vietnam veterans to discuss their experiences with others. And we had the good fortune to talk to Larry just a little bit about this and Tony just a little bit about this before the program began this morning. When I teach my class on the Vietnam War, I always invite 
at least one veteran to come and speak to the class about his or her time in the country. The interaction with the students is always positive. They gain a deeper understanding of an individual's time in Vietnam, not one that is filtered through the media or textbooks or even the instructor, me. And the veterans enjoy teaching the students and sharing their first-hand knowledge of events. Students like mine throughout the United States are benefiting from a very fine government program run through the Library of Congress, which some of you may have already participated in, the Veterans History Project. If you have not had the opportunity to participate in this program, I encourage you to do so. Any veteran may participate and tell their story, which, in turn, is stored in a massive historical database to be used by our future by our and future generations to gain a better understanding of the American military experience in the 20, 20th and 21st centuries. Veterans share whatever they wish through video, audio, or the written word, and photographs as well may also be shared. The place to go for more information on this, and I have a website, is loc.gov.vets, and I know Sherry has dealt with this through the Gold Star. Um, there is an information kit there that seeks to answer a number of your questions. Through the process of interviewing veterans of America's wars in the 20th and 21st centuries, my students that participate in this gain a deeper understanding of what our servicemen and servicewomen have gone through. Telling for service people, telling their stories can also provide catharsis for our veterans who sometimes will tell strangers things they would not tell members of their own family. While these interviews provide or prove both beneficial to the interviewer, my student, and the interviewee, again I want to reiterate that the chief beneficiary is the nation, since all the pictures, audio, video, and transcripts of these interviews are held by the Library of Congress and made available to students, historians, and members of the public free of charge who seek a deeper understanding of the many faces of American veterans' experience. It is through projects like these that we open lines of communication between generations of Americans, which in turn creates and nourishes understanding and respect for the experiences of others and leads us to a stronger and better nation. Here too, I think we find some of that silver lining. On a cold January day in 1960, John Kennedy promised in his inaugural address that the United States would, and I quote, pay any price, bear any burden, and meet any hardship in order to assure the survival and success of liberty. I believe, as a statement of faith, and I think I can argue as a professional historian, and probably prove to many of you, that these words inspired a great many young Americans in 1960, some of them probably in this room. And I'm also thinking specifically here of Colonel Hal Moore from his book, We Were Soldiers, who carried that conviction into the Adran Valley in 1965. I also believe that neither John Kennedy, nor Hal Moore, nor any American serviceman or servicewoman who served in Vietnam anticipated that the price would be so high, the burden so heavy, or the hardship to be so great. But for those who did serve in Indochina, I think there are a number of silver linings that make their service to our country just as important, if not more important, than any American who has fought to preserve our nation, its government, and its freedom across our history. One of the things that historians do is help us put things into perspective that perhaps we miss when we're so closely associated with the events that are taking place. It's kind of that 
you can't see the forest for the trees concept. So thank you. Our next speaker is Tony Powers, who also served in Vietnam, was wounded there, received a medical retirement, and then came back to Des Moines. And many of you had the opportunity to see and hear him on WHO radio and WHO TV and broadcasting football and basketball games. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Tony for some of his perspectives on his military experiences. Tony? <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. So great to, uh, to be here uh, again, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I'm just really humbled and honored to be able to uh, address you today. And I was sitting there listening to our speakers and just wondering what a small world uh, it is. Uh, Fred, I'm an Indiana grad, uh, May 1972, BA in radio and television. Uh, professor, my wife and I, we stop in Kearney all the time on our way to, on our way to Denver. And our main speaker, Cesar Smith, my boss, Jim Zobel, just loved you. Remember the old Bud commercial, I love you, man? Well, he loved you, and the old North, Des Moines North track team, that's all he talked about was track, the Flying Four. So what a small world uh, it is here today. Uh, I was going to visit with you about, uh, a little bit about my broadcasting career. Uh, I had a chance to work with two great broadcasters. Uh, the late Pete Taylor, how many remember Pete? He used to work at KCCI and was the voice of Iowa State Athletics. Uh, and of course, uh, my old boss, the late Jim Zop. Who could ever forget old Jim? With Pete, you could tune into the uh, Iowa State Radio Network when he did play-by-play -play and. And in my opinion, you could almost tell immediately whether the Cyclones were winning or losing just by the inflection in his voice. You could turn on the radio and hear Pete and, oh my gosh, Iowa State's losing, or you could turn on the radio and his voice would be kind of up on octave and, oh gosh, they're winning. Uh, with, uh, with Jay Z's voice, you really couldn't tell. Uh, I turned into, uh, tuned into one game that uh, Jim was announcing that uh, was an Iowa-Ohio State game. And Jim's saying, it's an Iowa touchdown! It's an Iowa touchdown! I love it! I love it! I love it! The score, Ohio State 36, Iowa 6. <laughs> I mean, Jim, he gets you up here and then all of a sudden you're down here. And, uh, but I'm sure they're all in uh, broadcast heaven today with uh, Pete up there with uh, the legendary Jack Trice. And uh, what, a, what a great football player he was. And of course, Jay-Z with the famous Niall Kenick. And uh, rest in peace, fellas, uh, up there in broadcast heaven. As I said, I'm very humbled and honored to be here today to, to help honor our brave men and women who have shed blood in defense of our country. The Purple Heart has been awarded to many of our men and women warriors of the U.S. Armed Forces who have made the ultimate sacrifice of giving their lives for their country or have been wounded in action. It is a true badge of courage. Many died or were wounded saving the lives of others. and We thank them so much for their meritorious service and sacrifice. I wanted to tell you a little bit today about our medic in Vietnam. We called him Doc, and he was from Minnesota. His dream after completing military service was to attend college and medical school, then apply to become a surgeon at the famous Mayo Clinic. He loved to talk about the latest advancements in medicine during our, town, uh, our downtime at the uh, Ninth Division Base Camp, which was south of Saigon. My, our old unit was the 2nd Battalion, 39th Infantry, 9th Infantry Division. For a 20-year-old, he always seemed to be reading a, a medical magazine or book and instead of talking about his girlfriend or car, as most of us did back in those days. 
One day, our company, we were pinned down by intense enemy fire. And I remember hearing someone yell, medic, medic, we need a medic down here. Get us a medic. And what happened was there was a wounded man about 30 yards away. I remember Doc was a little to my right and just behind me. And I remember I reminded him, I, say, I said, now Doc, whatever you do, stay low. Stay behind the dike and go help uh, the man that needs you. So Doc moved about, probably about 10 yards, and then he just suddenly fell to the earth and lay there lifeless. He'd been shot right through the neck and died instantly. I saw him die, ladies and gentlemen. And that sight has haunted me for the last 45 years. Just think what a, a great surgeon that he would have been at the Mayo Clinic. He would have been a wonderful doctor. And just think about how different the world would be today if Doc and the thousands of others who had given their lives for our country had lived. A few months ago, I watched 60 Minutes and uh, reporter Steve Kropp was in Iran and the Iranians seemed to have given him total access to their country. And while watching the show, I was surprised at how modern Iran looked. Tehran reminded me of San Francisco. And many of the Iranians were dressed just like you and me. They were driving cars, and walking down the streets shopping. Steve went out in the streets to interview some of the Iranians. He asked them about their nuclear program and what they thought about the United States. Every person he interviewed was afraid to give him a straight answer. They said they really couldn't talk about that. They were obviously afraid. That struck me right then and there as the big difference between this great country of ours and some others in the world. We're free, we're free ladies and gentlemen, we're free to say what's on our minds. That's what's so great about the United States of America and that's why it's worth defending today. We're free, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll always be free because heroes like Doc and countless others, they protected our freedoms. And that's why we're free today. In the May-June 2014 issue of Purple Heart Magazine, Mario Yabera Jr., who is one of the Vietnam orphans, wrote this rendition of what a Purple Heart is. A purple heart does not beat. There is no claim of victory or defeat. Acts of war for many who dare. Courageous minds are those it declares. A purple heart does not bleed. An ounce of freedom it painstakingly feeds. A scar, a limb, a perilous life. No questions, no answers, or a strife. A purple heart does not falter. Sacrifices are many on a combat altar. Distant hues of a battled land. Senseless resolution for a political man. A purple heart does not spare. Accolade of a wounded memory and despair. Heroes are those that it conceives. Indebted honor who receives. Wasn't that written brilliantly? Unbelievable by Mario Yabura Jr. Thank him so much for writing that. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and God bless our Purple Heart recipients. Thank you. Brings back lots of memories. Our final speaker is Major Caesar Smith, U.S. Army Vietnam veteran, retired. His, the title of his presentation is, He Was Famous. And we all know people in, who served in the military and units and things that we've been in who were famous. And Caesar had the opportunity to meet some of those people too. So I'm sure he'll be interesting listening. Caesar served two tours of duty in Vietnam 
The first tour in 1964 as an infantry advisor for a South Vietnamese infantry battalion. His second tour was during the 1968 Tet Offensive, where he was a company commander of Delta Company, 2nd Battalion, 505th Airborne, 3rd Brigade of the 82nd Airborne. I'm sure glad he wrote that out, because I can't remember all that. <laughs> and he retired in 1976, has been very active in the Des Moines area ever since then, including the Fort Des Moines Museum in his past. He brings us his perspective of service in the Vietnam era, Caesar Smith. There's a <clears throat> clear my throat here. I want to thank the band. I didn't realize how important it was for you to have those little musicals every, every time somebody started. Because at my age, getting up and getting down is real good for me. <laughs> if I'd have said and not get up through all those talks, and when it's time for me to get up, I'm sure you'd have seen a different person getting up. <laughs> I got up first and then waited for my legs to be ready to move and then move. So appreciate getting up and getting down. That, that helps a lot. In the last stanza of a poem called Famous, Naomi Nile writes, I want to be famous in the way a pulley is famous, or a buttonhole. Not because it did anything spectacular, but because it never forgot what it could do. When asked about the poem, she replied, You trust the buttonhole, don't you? Don't you trust a pulley to know what is it is intended to do? A pulley is a discreet, subtle, but very useful, important implement. <coughs> Everything is famous if you notice it. Everything is famous if you notice it. Everyone is famous if you notice it. The words, thank you for your service, which acknowledges and says you appreciate what service people have done, says that you recognize they are famous. We've come a long way since Vietnam. There are a lot of famous military people in this room Certainly all of those who receive the Purple Heart are famous. Every soldier I served with is famous. Every military person I see is famous. They've given back. That makes them famous. When Carter Barnes, my artillery forward observer, returned home from Vietnam in 1969, he was spit on at the airport. I first met Carter when I joined the 3rd Brigade, 82nd Airborne, up near a way at the base camp. When Carter joined my unit, he was a second lieutenant, just out of training, and now he was going to be in a combat situation. So as a company commander, I told Carter, you need to know our location at all times. Since he was going to be responsible for us receiving the artillery fire, you need to always know where we are, whether we're on the top of a mountain, whether we're down in the, in the valley, whether we're in the forest, wherever we are, Carter, I expect you to know our location. Anytime I say, what's our location, you better tell us our location. Now, on occasion, when we'd be in the jungle, he'd say, can I shoot a smoke round up, which would explode in the air, just to make sure I'm located where we are. Well, I said, Carter, you, you shoot around up like that, everybody's going to know where we are. <laughs> but on occasion, we'd be out, and I'd say, okay, go ahead. And 99% of the time, Carter was right on. And that was, that was good. As a matter of fact, we've been out for a couple weeks on an operation, and the point man of our first platoon was out, and all of a sudden, I got a call from the platoon leader, and he said, we need to stop. And he put me in touch with the point man, who's the number one guy. And I, understand, I don't even understand how they or why they want to do that. He was out in front of everybody. So he calls back and I get him on the phone and they called me Apache 6. We all had these names, these Indian names. Mine was Apache 6. I always sounded real good. So Apache 6 and he says, I got a chicken. I said, you got a chicken? He said, there's a chicken in front of me. Now at first I'm going, okay, what's that got to do with where we're going? Never thought about it. 
first off, I don't know about the jungle you've been in, but there aren't any wild chickens running around in the jungle. <laughs> so what he was concerned about, it was probably in the back of a North Vietnamese soldier carrying his food with him. So he says, I, I would like to have artillery recon before we move forward. I looked at Carter, and Carter said it's on his play. He said two 800 walking, which meant he was sending two rounds, 155, 800 meters out, and they were going to walk him back towards the point man until the point man said stop. And of course, the point man couldn't afford to wait too long to say stop because that artillery was coming right at him. After it was over, we moved on. We didn't run into anything. But everybody in the unit felt confident that Carter was going to be there and help us if we needed him to. I'm going to fast forward up to probably the last, one of the last operations I was on. We'd been out two weeks. It was in a search and destroy mission. There was supposed to be a large enemy located on one of the hills in our area. We'd been out, and every night we always tried to get on the high ground. So we were crossing Little Creek at the bottom the base of the hill, and we were going to fill up all the canteens before we settled in for the night. So we set up a perimeter, and all the platoons sent a unit down to the creek to fill up the canteen. Every, every one of the guys carried about four or five canteens. I mean, usually we were out three days at a time before we ever resupplied. And we only tried using a water vat one time. That's a huge container of water that they'll bring in with a helicopter. It's got these little spigots all the way around it. And you can get this good water from it. Well, we tried that one time. Helicopter came in with this big, ugly thing hanging from the bottom of it. And we were kind of on a little mound. And as it was we were trying to get him to make sure it wasn't on the side of the mound to drop it. But when he dropped it, it hit the side of that hill, and all we saw was going down the hill. <laughs> just rolling down the hill and just knocking out everything. Needless to say, we tried to get down to get the water. But after that, I said, okay, you have your iodine tablets with you. We filled up in the creek. So there we were. We set up the perimeter, and we filled up the water in the creek. Alec Horn, which was in the first platoon, which had set up the perimeter in the front part as we looked up the mountain, had found a trail. He was kind of exploring the trail when we heard fire, all of a sudden gunfire going off. Immediate automatic fire, and immediately Alec Horn was dropped and died on the spot. And then we came under heavy fire from all sides in front of us. And I looked at Carter, he said, on the way. And by the time he said, on the way, the artillery started hitting the mountain top. I was on the phone and talked to my lieutenants to find out what the situation was. We were under heavy fire and we continued to fire and at that time, just like in a movie, it started raining. I mean, rain was coming down hard, we were under hard fire. It's thick of jungle, they can't bring in reinforcements. Everybody I knew was up in the helicopter above us, the commanding general was up there, my battalion commander was up there, there were gunships coming in to help us and the firefight just continued on and on for about two and a half hours. No breaking, and we realized that we needed to get a better position because it was starting to get dark. So I called the third platoon leader, told him to get back across the creek, set up the perimeter, we're gonna move back and try to find a place where we would be on level ground for the night. He moved back, the other two platoons set up a wider perimeter, and by the time the lieutenant in the third platoon got across, he called back and he said, we're across, we're set up, but you need to move fast. The water now, because it's been raining then for over two hours, the water in the creek now was at least waist deep and it's still rising. So me and the other two platoons, one at a time, got back across that creek. The last platoon got back across, the water was under their arms as they crossed back across it. We had casualties, we were carrying the young man who had died, we had wrapped him up in ponchos and we were carrying him, and we moved back trying to get as away from as far as ways we could from the superior force of fire. I don't know how long we went, but we went as far as we could before dark fell on us and set up our perimeter. Carter and I and my radio man, Bob Zeman, kind of wedged our ways in between trees so we'd stay up all night and it'd be easier for us to do that by standing. We stayed up between the trees talking to the commanders who were up in the helicopters. Everyone would be there with us all night long. And we were hoping we'd gotten far enough away from that enemy force that they wouldn't be following us at night. During the night, Carter and I crawled around talking to the other platoons to make sure everybody was awake. We were exhausted, so there's no question we were going to sleep. There was no question the morale was down because of our comrade we had lost. We got through the night, 
The next day we finally got on the radio with the commander, found an area where we could move to that had enough clearing, we hoped, so that we could get the dead and the, and the wounded out. It took us almost half a day to get there. And during the time we were moving to that area, enemy soldiers were following us and we were fighting on the flanks as we moved back. We got to the area. We set up the perimeter, we had to blow some trees so they met him back again to, to take out the wound and our dead comrade. We got reinforcements and moved on. We were going to be out a couple more weeks. A week after we got away from that situation, got a call, a helicopter was coming to get Carter. He only had three weeks before he was going back home and his replacement was coming in. Before the helicopter could get there with his replacement, Carter had called back and asked for another week to stay with us to train and break in the new replacement to be sure he would be the kind of forward observer Carter said we should have with us. So we, he stayed with us another week, and then they finally brought in the helicopter and said, Carter, it's time for you to go home. Last I saw him at that time, he was sitting in the door of the helicopter as I left. He saluted and I saluted and I said, thank you. 35 years later, I'm at home, my phone rang. This was in 2004. I said, hello, and the voice at the other end said, do you know your location? <laughs> <laughs> it was Carter. He'd been trying to find me for 20 years. We talked, we got together. He'd gotten Parkinson's disease from being in Agent Orange while we were in Vietnam. He was doing havoc on his body. He was jerking around. He was on a lot of medication. He was living in Illinois at the time. He came over to see me, and I went over to see him. And eventually, he and his wife moved up to northern Minnesota where she had family because he was getting worse. He died two years ago. He was a good man, a good soldier, husband, father, and friend, and he was famous. We're here today to honor and appreciate and acknowledge those receiving the Purple Heart. But let us always remember, all who serve are famous. Thank you. Well, as we reflect over the <clears throat> stories and things we've heard in the last hour <clears throat> truly are reminded that we all have a great deal to be thankful for. When we get up in the morning, we have a pretty good chance it's going to be a good day. And I hope that your days turn out that way just like all of us.